I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at ANSYS with Arvind Vale, who's going to talk today about ADAS and some of the problems that are cropping up in automotive design. So Arvind, what are we starting to run into in terms of design with cars? As we start getting into more uh, autonomous vehicles, as we start getting into uh, driver assist, what are, what are you seeing as some of the problems and how do you view this? The, the way in which we see uh, the automotive industry transitioning is there are three major mega trends, if you will. Uh, the first among them is the connected car, where we're seeing more and more communication infrastructure that goes along with vehicle to vehicle communication, vehicle to infrastructure, as well as the security blanket that goes along with all these types of communications. And this is going to be a big growth area in terms of all types of communication with the automotive industry. So the next aspect is about the electrification of cars, where we see improving battery technology, power efficiency, driving the automotive industry transitioning from fossil fuel based to uh, electrification. Uh, this is going to be the next biggest growth area in the automotive industry. And the third aspect is going to be the ADAS system, which we'll talk in detail about. Let's go into some of these individually. So in, when you're starting to connect the car and you're starting to deal with this V2X, whether it's V2V, V2I, V2 uh, whatever it happens to be at some point in the future, what kinds of issues do you run into in terms of the design? What do you have to think about? Is this straight throughput like we, we see in a computer system, or is there more to it? Uh, there's a lot more to just plain throughput and compute power, right? Uh, the number one aspect is how do you ensure that all the automotives are in a uniquely connected system, uh, whether it be a vehicle to vehicle or vehicle to infrastructure? Uh, one needs to come up with standards that conform across the automotive industry to be able to communicate all these types of networks. So these are some of the main challenges that you will see going forward. And they also have to be secure. I noticed you have security as one of your items here. Mm -hmm. Can they actually be secure or are there just too many ways in and out of a car that you have to now think about when you're designing? Well, that's a great question. Security is always there to be broken and you will always see people breaking into secure systems. But uh, as we see the industry progressing you know, on the security side, uh, we are seeing that uh, the security is going to be embedded within the electronics. Security is going to be embedded in different levels of the software stack. And uh, we see this as a trend in the entire automotive industry. Except that when we've dealt with security in the past, we tend to think of it in terms of the product cycle. The product cycle, even on a server, is four to five years. On a car, it might be 20 years. By that point, the hackers are going to be a lot more sophisticated, and the tools they have are going to be a lot more sophisticated than what they have today when you're designing this stuff. Right, right. No, that's absolutely right. Uh, what the automotive industry does right now is it tries to decouple the security system that compromises the actual drivability of a car with a security system that just allows the communication with the exterior world. So in that way, you really cannot be completely compromised from a driving situation, and you don't want a car that's designed now to be compromised five years later. Uh, but that is still a pretty big risk at this point. And when we get into the electrification of the cars, we're now thinking in terms of horsepower, we're thinking in terms of gigahertz, What, how these things are going to run in terms of speed of processing, right? Mm -hmm. Um, well, electrification of cars is essentially uh, the movement from fossil fuel based engines into an actual electric vehicle. And some of the things that come along with that is uh, the battery technology. You know, how fast we're moving in the battery technology, it's not really, we're not progressing that quickly as in Moore's Law. Uh, battery technology only doubles the capacity every 10 years as opposed to Moore's Law, which is every 18 months. You know, you're able to cram in more, uh, uh, process, uh, more transistors. Uh, into the same chip. Um, so there's going to be some inherent hurdles that you will see uh, as we go into this electrification rule. But what, what we see is uh, pretty much the entire industry is going to transform into electrified cars as opposed to fossil fuel based cars. And so we're starting to think of a car as a complete electrical system the same way we've thought about power on a, a mobile device in the past, right? You need to start carving out improvements on efficiency everywhere. Right, right. And the biggest efficiency that we need to carve out is power efficiency, because power is essentially consuming you know, current, and that's essentially what is being stored you know, in these batteries. Uh, so you will see that batteries become more and more efficient. Uh, the engines or, or the electric uh, uh, motors that we use in these electric cars become more and more efficient, as well as the systems that we build around this entire car, be it infotainment, be it ADAS, will all become more and more power efficient. The ADAS system is an incredibly complex logic development. Uh, we've never even encountered this before. It's basically putting a supercomputer inside a car and then putting it into something that you can run with a battery somewhere. 
nobody's ever tried this before. Are we able to accomplish this? Is this going to be doable? If you look at the history of ADAS, it actually started off with safety and reliability. It was essentially built to make sure that the driver and the vehicle were safe in an environment and were reliably operating in an environment. But today, we're essentially looking at the ADAS as transforming from automation to autonomous. And that is where the big change is going to come from in the ADAS systems. And we're now talking about being able to do that, which is basically more power for the computation, in addition to being able to last three or 400 miles and be able to charge quickly. Absolutely, but if you look at the ADAS, if you, step, if you go one step back uh, and you look at how an ADAS system is actually built, it's got different components to it. The first component is the sensing component, the next component is the processing, and the third component is the action. Now, the processing component is where all the brains and all the compute power is. But if you look at the sensing and the acting, it's still simplified systems at this point. But what we are seeing is, uh, as we go into more and more autonomous vehicles, the sensing as well as the uh, processing power is getting more and more sophisticated. We're getting into a lot more hybrid sensors uh, by fusing uh, ultrasonic radar and LiDAR sensors into one fusion sensor and taking all the data and applying massive amounts of compute power to do object identification, object classification, and take action based on what the actual uh, computer sees. So we're going to see a transformation in this going forward. And so basically what you're talking about here is moving some of the processing power out toward the sensors as well, right? Because you can't send all that data in. Absolutely. Uh, as sensors become more and more powerful, a lot of processing power is also being embedded near the sensor, as opposed to just having one sensor for the complete car. And you will see this uh, as a trend going uh, forward, that most of these sensors have enormous amount of compute power built in when they actually sense the data. So what does this mean in terms of power and efficiency design? Does it all have to now be the same kind of, uh, of incredibly efficient kind of design that we've had in data centers in the past? The automotive industry requires a different type of design philosophy. The first and foremost is safety and reliability. And when you look at safety and reliability, all these components have to operate within 150 degrees Fahrenheit. And in terms of reliability, they need to be able to operate on the road between 10 and 15 years. And when you look at a commodity electronic and compare it with an automotive electronic, it's vastly different in these types of reliability scenarios. And they also have to be shielded so that you're not dealing with uh, electromagnetic interference of any sort too, right? So these signals are moving very fast, but they also have to be clean. Uh, all the electronic system that we're going to design for an automotive uh, electronic system needs to be efficient in terms of power as well as in terms of all the signals that's transferred from one, one place to another. And you will see that uh, as we uh, start to use more advanced technology nodes, power integrity and signal integrity for the semiconductor chips become more and more important in the automotive world as well. Historically, we used to use 190 nanometer for designing automotive chips, but today, we're actually designing the same automotive chips in 16 nanometer or 7 nanometer FinFET technology, which is vastly different from what uh, the automotive industry is used to seeing. And we're also designing these in a very harsh environment and also having to deal with things like electromigration and preventing that, the same kinds of things that you deal with at the most advanced nodes right now. Absolutely. The most advanced nodes uh, make it very difficult to close items like electromigration or thermal behavior. Now, when you're taking these advanced electromagnetic advanced nodes and putting them on an automotive system, you need to ensure that you're satisfying the same conditions for automotive safety. Uh, if you look at uh, the standard ISO 26262, uh, it's essentially related to the functional safety of any electronic system on an automotive. And every single semiconductor chip or electronic system you design has to conform to those standards. So taking all this into account, which is just incredible complexity, what does the future of automotive look like? The way I look at the future of the industry is it's going to be transformative, moving from plain automation to autonomous. Today, we are at level two automation. And level five is where we reach real self-driving capabilities. Uh, we're still at least 20 years away from that. And the way in which we're going to transform from where we are today to 20 years down the line is artificial intelligence, deep learning, as well as neural networks. 
And when you're talking the industries at level two, it's the most advanced cars that are level two. Most cars are still level zero, right? Absolutely. The most of the most advanced cars that we drive today, where we think is completely you know, autonomous, is actually at level two. But where we want to be is completely autonomous, where the driver does not need to take any action, even for a safety critical scenario, is where we are at level five. Uh, so we still have at least 20 years to go for that. So the kids who are thinking they don't have to get their license because they're going to have a self-driving car, they better start thinking again about that. Absolutely, but not 20 years down the line. Arvind Vale, thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Ed.